Okay, so let's read in some data. Let's access the data that's stored in our raw data folder. Let's put in um, a raster to begin with. So we go down to our raster file, it's here. Um, and we can see here, this is a TIFF, uh, it's stored in this folder. Um, quick note about this folder name, it's a very, very long folder name. It's descriptive. Um, again, when it comes to rasters, we may potentially uh, run across a problem with some of the older raster tools whereby long paths, uh, spaces, strange Swedish letters can cause problems. Uh, or if you, wherever you are, just stick to basic ASCII, keep the names as short as possible. This is really breaking my rules, but I downloaded this file and, and I haven't bothered renaming it. Um, so this, this is not ideal. Uh, it could cause problems. But anyway, moving on, here we have the raster layer. It's a TIFF, and it's actually, if we click there, we can see it consists of three bands. Uh, so it's an RGB image, uh, red, green, blue. It's a true color image. Um, and we can add this, we can either add individual bands as grayscale layers, or we can add the, the image as a whole. We could drag and drop it if we want, or right click and add to current band. Uh, and when we do that, it says, do we want to build pyramids? Uh, for the sake of this, I'll just click on no. It's not a huge file at the moment, so let's not worry too much about it. Pyramids is just a stack of smaller and smaller files where each pixel becomes larger and larger. Uh, it covers the same area as the main image. It just helps with zooming in and zooming out. The, the program doesn't have to resample all the time. Every time you zoom in, it can just access a ready-made layer. It takes can take a while to do this, depending on the file size to begin with. Um, but once it's done, it's there and saved. Uh, I would uh, recommend doing it if you have the space, um, but it's not it's not entirely necessary. Um, it can help with, with much larger files. So now we've read that file and we have our raster here. So let's, um, uh, we can then try and uh, adjust the, uh, what it looks like perhaps. Um, if we right click there, and we go down to, let's first of all look at the properties. And here we have just some general information. We click on the metadata, there's nothing in there. Uh, there should be metadata for this, but uh, Arc doesn't want to read it. Click on source. Now source is, let's come back to that. We'll click on elevation, not much happening there. Display, kind of, what, what are these for? Take a look at all these tabs that don't really contain much. Now the reason that some of these don't contain much is that we haven't put that information in. There are no joins to this at the moment. Uh, joins to a raster is a bit odd as well. Um, but mostly, if we look at source, this is where most of the relevant information is. This tells us the path here, um, the, the, the name of the file. We can click on raster information. It tells us the number of columns and rows, uh, the number of bands in the, in, in the file and the cell size, amongst other things. And we can see here that it's a TIFF file, unsigned character there. Um, uh, eight bit depth zero to two five five. Uh, that's uh, they're telling us the, the the number of light intensity levels. Uh, metadata, uh, not much happening there. Now statistics. Uh, quite often there are no statistics. I've already calculated the statistics for this raster layer, so they're in here. If you don't have statistics. Um, why are we bringing this up? This is because it comes down to the visualization again, how we're showing the, the information. This tells us the range of values and the average value uh, in, the, um, uh, in the data set, which is quite relevant for how we visualize the, the information. There are a couple of other things we can look at here. The spatial reference, for example, which coordinate system we're using, Sphere F99TM. This is Sweden, so it's using the, the national grid. If you don't have statistics, let's just quickly click on catalog up here, we right click there, calculate statistics, and you run that function and it will calculate the statistics for the layer. I've already done that for this, so we don't need to bother with that right now. Let's go back to here, right click on the layer, click on symbology, uh, and we can see here that uh, we've got the three layers. Uh, we can change those around if we're not, uh, if we don't think that it's interpreted the, the, the bands correctly, we can just swap those about. I mean, this can happen on occasions that, so that now they're going in the other direction. As you can see, the coloring now starts to look a little weird. We don't want that. It had read them incorrectly. So had read them incorrectly. 
So we have our three bands there, R, G, B, but the, the image looks a little washed out, so we can change the stretch. Um, there are different ways, standard deviation perhaps, let's look at that. Oof. No, that's kind of washed out. We could change the number of standard deviations, but actually the minimum maximum is probably going to give us the, the best here. And here we can see the statistics, the, the minimum, maximum, the, the range of values, they all, they all max out. So the, the, the light intensity uh, is as great as, the, as the, the, uh, the, at least the data storage could manage. The camera may possibly have been able to store higher values uh, or sense higher values, uh, but didn't. Not sure uh, what um, whether that's the case or not. But the minimum value is it didn't go down to fully uh, fully black. Uh, it stopped before getting fully dark. There was always some light in each pixel. Uh, we can see the mean values are actually quite low, uh, but that's the mean over the entire area. So and now we have this image, and I, I'm quite okay with that. So now we've read that in, we can click on save there. And we're done with that. 